As returnees, we often run into some things that can be shocking when we get back home, sometimes after decades and decades abroad. And one of those things that uh, constantly surprise me is the issue of child brides, where you find uh, young kids, often as young as nine, uh, getting married or being married off. Now, just to be clear, the issue of child brides is a worldwide phenomenon that pervades many, many communities in almost every single continent. So I don't want anybody to uh, assume this is an African thing. In fact, just Google uh, child brides in America. You'd be surprised uh, what you find out there. This is a worldwide problem, but it is very much present within our communities. So many years ago, uh, the issue of child brides seemed to have been fairly acceptable and probably was the norm in many communities, but over time, uh, attitudes have changed and uh, it's no longer as acceptable as it used to be. And so today in this video, I will tell you the life story of a child bride in Kisumu and how her life uh, evolved uh, within a span of about uh, 60 years. And my hope really is that uh, you can learn some life lessons uh, from her story and perhaps most importantly, uh, you will learn about things that we, especially returnees, can do to alter the course of lives for children in similar circumstances. Good morning, family. If you're new to our channel, I hope you stick around to the end of the video. And again, if this content interests you enough, uh, we hope to see you back again either as a subscriber or as a regular viewer. We film from uh, Kisumu, uh, specifically Karateng, which is a village in Western Kenya. And uh, while we're still filming within Kisumu today, the location is slightly different. We're actually shooting from uh, a place called Kisumu Kadongo, uh, a place called Kisian. Uh, Kadongo, uh, Kisian is within Kadongo. And uh, our home really is still within Kisumu, but a place called Karateng Kodongo. So the names can be kind of confusing, but these places are only about uh, 10 minutes apart. And we are filming from my maternal uh, grandmother's home. So if you haven't figured it out yet, the child bride uh, about whom I am talking shares DNA with me. She is my grandmother, a woman that has survived unimaginable life uh, circumstances. It really is still a miracle to me to see her still alive, kicking, happy, and uh, going about life. So in terms of her age, I'm not exactly sure how old she is because uh, uh, part of it is uh, many of our grandmothers, we didn't know how old they were. The paperwork they have was sort of made up. So she's probably anywhere between 75 and 85. And uh, my grandmother is one of the most important women in my life, one who has taught me a, a lot of life lessons. In fact, my story would have been very different without uh, many of the life choices she made over the years. And this is just one of the many, many, many reasons why I absolutely love, love this old woman here. So her life story does not begin in Kisumu. Uh, this story begins in a place called Asembo, which is where she was born, some really rocky country out, I believe, in Sierra County, still within uh, Western Kenya. She was born in a very large family, had multiple, multiple siblings, and I believe uh, she had more than one mother. The father had more than one wives. And uh, unfortunately for her, her mother died when she was still a very young girl. I, I, in fact, I don't even think she got to know her mom. And folks, if you have not seen poverty, I can tell you poverty has a way of really stealing dreams. Within a short time, uh, she found herself married uh, to my grandfather in a different village, which is now uh, uh, Kadongo, as my grandfather's first wife. And uh, I think in part, early marriage was a way to deal with poverty and probably still is uh, till today. But there are also other cultural reasons why girls would get married early that I know a big part of uh, marriage, especially children that were orphans, many of them were often married off as a way to deal with poverty and perhaps even make money out of it. So she found herself in uh, that circumstance. Unfortunately for her too, uh, my grandfather uh, was a total orphan. 
So she got she moved from poverty to another level of poverty, which was almost like moving from uh, fire to an even bigger fire. They had so much trouble missing, uh, meeting basic needs. I, I, I don't know how they survived. I really don't. But I remember as a kid, uh, we would go visit uh, my brother and I. That was back in the 80s. There are certain things that uh, were so much fun. But I remember walking into this grass-touched uh, dirt house in the middle of a swamp. And rainy seasons were terrible because you would have roofs leaking. And uh, in the middle of the house, you'd have what we call a chair or some sort of springs uh, that are popping up in the middle of the house and water everywhere. But as a, as a kid, you look... And, and again, as I was saying, as a kid, uh, all of that really didn't mean a whole lot. Uh, it's not until later on as an adult that I came to realize that most of that was uh, poverty. But in all, I have lots of lots of really good uh, memories. In fact, right now, as you're looking at my, my other grandmother, who was my grandfather's? Who is my grandfather's third wife? And my grandmother, who gave birth to my mom, is the lady sitting right uh, across on the right, in a beautiful African kitenge with the headgear. That's her. And uh, some of these are my cousins, some of my aunts, uh, others, uh, their kids, and it's all a mix of folks. So I have a lot of uh, really, really good memories uh, visiting my grandparents in this particular home, and so. My grandparents always, always had farm animals. They had uh, cows, they had dogs, they had all that. In the morning, we would wake up and uh, sit next to grandpa milking, uh, wearing a kala. In fact, I, I don't remember uh, ever seeing my grandfather putting on modern shoes. And for those of you who don't know what a kala is, a kala is a type of uh, organic uh, shoes made of recycled tires. They're very durable. You can put them on for years. Unfortunately, they are not necessarily standard. And so the left side may not match the right side in terms of size. And all that depended on who did it. But nonetheless, this home was and still is really full of love. I remember climbing on these uh, mango trees, running around. Uh, I mean, we, we had so much fun in this place. As kids, uh, because we didn't have uh, mattresses, and this would happen only when we came to visit my grandparents. We often slept on mats and we had to share blankets. So you'd have like a bunch of kids with one blanket. Again, all of this was so much fun. And we really didn't know that. It was just simply people managing poverty. At night, because we didn't have electricity, we would use uh, something called nyangile, which is a type of uh, 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 light source that uses kerosene. The trick was, if something was funny, you got to make sure you don't laugh in the direction of the lamp because then you'd switch it off. And in most cases, we would go to bed by probably 7, 7.30 because you had to save uh, kerosene. Uh, my grandma, in fact, uh, for the most part, uh, would, would always set us in such a way that all the kids would eat together. So you sit around a uh, uh, main meal and you all eat from the same dish. So that, again, was so much fun. But, you know, it was all about uh, uh, managing poverty. In most cases, you, you would have so much soup in, in whatever food you're eating because it was always ugali plus some kind of soup and a little bit of, uh, of vegetables. So in all these years, uh, we had so much fun in this house. So actually, what you're looking at on the left is my grandmother's kitchen. And then much further to the right is the third uh, grandmother's uh, uh, home and maybe if i didn't mention it earlier my grandmother who again is the woman with the headgear uh cutting a uh, chicken was one of three wives she was the first one and her second co-wife who is my second grandmother passed on very early in life and left all of her kids in the care of my grandmother and then the third grandmother who is sitting uh, right here on the right is still around and she's got kids, she's got grandkids and all that. And uh, together, uh, these women here have raised a ton of kids. My grandmother raised her one biological child, which is my mother. And if you didn't know that, yes, my mother was an only child from her mom's house, but she had siblings from other houses. And my grandmother's house is always, always full of people. And so uh, the bigger challenge here is that you can imagine an African woman 
having inside only one biological child and what made it worse at the time is that the one child she has was female. So this really made her life 10 times harder in a community that really valued lots of kids and especially male kids. So in this community, uh, essentially she was considered as a childless woman because she only had one biological female child and no males at all. So that was always uh, a difficult uh, thing for her in her community. But you know, my grandfather was really nice. I, he was such a cool dude. I really have no memories of him not being uh, a nice person, even though now that I'm, a, I'm an, an adult, I hear stuff. And of course, nobody is perfect. But for me, all I had were just amazing memories of that old man. He had passed on probably uh, more than almost 20 years ago. So despite all of this, uh, my grandmother has always, always been a major, major hustler. She sold mandazi, sold chapati, and these are African foods. She sold uh, mitomba, which is uh, secondhand uh, uh, clothes, had like a mini shop. And she's always planting something in her uh, garden. And uh, kadongo right here is relatively dry. But despite that, she's always, always planting something. And, and again, as I mentioned earlier, in my grandma's house, you will always find people, many of whom I don't even know. There's always people living with her. She absolutely loves and loves to have people around. Even though she was not educated at all, she did everything to make sure that the kids in her care went to school. And I think this is how my mom uh, made it out. In fact, the kids that may have not gone to school in the house only failed because of personal choices. But my grandmother did everything, everything uh, to make sure that uh, folks were successful in school. I remember when I was in college, she would come back from her the market, call me in advance, bring me stuff. I mean, she did anybody who was in school. She was always going to do whatever she had to do to make sure that you were successful. And she's also a really big uh, woman of faith. She's one person that never, never gives up. The idea of giving up is not in her vocabulary. And one thing that really warms my heart is just the size of her heart, literally and figuratively. Uh, by the way, she has uh, CHF. Her heart is uh, really enlarged, and that's one of the medical issues she's dealing with. But she also has a very large heart figuratively, always smiling, always has room for people. In her home, you can never get go in and leave empty-handed. If you come in, she has to give you something, whether it's a... Uh, uh, chicken, live chicken, you go with it. Oh, she's taking something from her garden. You always have to carry something when you leave her house. And of course, when you show up, like it's true with every African household, when you show up, you have to eat. And she does not care whether you just had a meal somewhere or not. When you show up, be sure you're going to eat something. And of course, uh, she has got this unique thing that I hear with most uh, grandmothers in, in, in Luo land where she called all of her male uh, grandkids Jaoda. So I show up and she calls me Jaoda. Jaoda simply means husband. I've never understood what that means in Luo. So if somebody understands uh, the origin of that uh, uh, phrasing for grandmothers calling their male grandkids Jaoda, if somebody understands that, maybe you can help explain what that is. Another unique thing, of course, that you'll find uh, in her home is lots of antiques. You'll find really old uh, cupboards, you got old utensils, stuff that uh, I saw 30 years ago that are still very well kept. So folks, this 12-year-old uh, uh, bride that meant absolutely nothing in her society at the time went on to raise lots of people. And it is because of the choices she made at the time that I get to speak with you today. Why it not for her and for the many, many folks around her, including my grandfather? Uh, I, I, would, I would not be here talking to you. And uh, in her home, actually today, she proudly speaks of having many professionals, including folks in the medical field. She has professors, she has teachers, she has folks in business and many, many other areas. And I really consider hers uh, a big success story. Sometimes I actually wonder how life might have been different had it not been for the life circumstances she went through, especially thinking about the poverty she survived, the lack of education, early marriage, 
and all the misfortunes uh, she survived. In some ways, uh, while I acknowledge that these things were made life very tough for her, they shaped uh, the life choices she made that eventually led to us being here. It's actually interesting that uh, the one biological child she had, which is my mother, uh, ended up having uh, raising eight kids. And so uh, I've always dream, dreamt of having many kids. Unfortunately, I live in America where that decision is not for us men to make. So uh, sadly, the reality is uh, a lot of what she went through is still very much present in today's villages. Uh, those who live in the village can attest to the same, same stories. So this is something that has ha happened over a span of 60 years. But when you go to many villages today, you still hear very similar stories, especially young women. So for returnees and folks who are curious enough, here are some things I would suggest. Number one, I know many, many returnees are very much involved in the community. We pay school fees, we support people and all that. But I've come to learn that uh, when you're home, if you get a few minutes here and there, please walk around. And when you do, get to talk to people, get to interact. You will learn a lot. Uh, I ask you to pay attention to often the kids and families that are invisible. Sometimes you run into stories that require uh, very little help from your part, but help that absolutely can be life-changing. Like for instance, where I, I met a kid, a young girl who literally was forced to drop out of school and only needed 1200 to get back to school. That's like $10. So I've, I've always, always learned a whole lot when I'm walking. I know it can be easy to just hop into your car, drive out, go to the city, do what you need to do. And by the way, this is in the middle of Kisumu City, for those who've never seen that. We're now driving back through Kisumu City. We need to pick a few things and get, get back home. It's easy to do that. But I highly encourage you to just walk around in the village once in a while, get to chat with people, connect, you will learn a whole lot more about things you could still help with, mainly that don't even require a whole lot on your part. And of course, uh, uh, many folks are already doing a good job with uh, charity. And so what I've come to learn is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Whatever problems you see, there's always somebody somewhere solving it in different ways. So connect with folks. And sometimes all you gotta do is just connect, it, connect people with resources. You don't have to be the one providing a solution. And as best as you can, uh, get the kids involved in any charity work you do. If you're paying school fees, uh, let them be involved. Let them know what's going on. Let, let them learn. If you're doing something uh, physically involving at home, go with the kids. Because this is a great opportunity for them to pick up uh, certain characters or dispositions like compassion, uh, being kind, some of the attitudes we want them to develop. So involve the kids as best as you can. And uh, in fact, some people actually make a career out of charity, charity work. I see lots of people who are running charity uh, organizations back at home and they're doing really well. So involve your kids as best as you can. And uh, more importantly, I would recommend that folks focus on long-term solutions. Because you go, you go at home and you go to hospitals, you go to schools and you see infrastructure, you see some really uh, good things out there. But then there's a lot of room to grow. Much of these are things that we have to do ourselves. We can't depend on other people to solve many of these problems. So I'm looking to hear your thoughts on how you are thinking about solving some of these big uh, ticket issues that we run into the village. Um, I, I really look forward to being a space where we can all share knowledge with each other and develop solutions to solve some of the systems level problems that we notice in the village. Now, like I said, you don't need a big group. You can do it on your own. You can do it with a friend or a partner. So I hope to hear from you and uh, I hope this uh, video was informative enough. I will see you in the next. Thank you.